Chapter 14 Leah and Falada Help her A meeting on the road Wolfies Two moons One We only talked for an hour, and I ended up doing most of it, but it was long enough for me to be sure that she was no ordinary farm girl. That probably sounds snobby, as if I don't believe farm girls can be smart or pretty or even beautiful. I don't mean any of those things. I'm sure there are even farm girls somewhere in this great round world of ours who are able to practice ventriloquism. There was something else, something more. She had a certain confidence, an air, as if she were used to having people, and not just farmhands, do her bidding. And after that first hesitation, probably caused by my sudden appearance, she showed absolutely no fear. I probably don't need to tell you that it only took that hour for me to fall head over heels in love with her, either, because you probably already knew it. It's how these stories go, isn't it? Only, for me, it was no story. It was my life. It was also Charlie Reed luck, fall for a girl who was not only older, but whose mouth I could never kiss. I would have been glad to kiss the scar where it had been, though, which ought to tell you how bad I had it. One other thing I knew was that, mouth or no mouth, she wasn't meant for the likes of me. She was more than just a girl feeding geese, a lot more. Besides, how much romance can you make when the beautiful girl has to talk to the love-struck Romeo through a horse? But that's what we did. 2. There was a gazebo near the garden. We sat inside at a little round table. A couple of the hands came out of the corn headed for the barn with full baskets, so I guessed it was summer over here instead of early October. The horse cropped grass nearby. A gray girl with a badly deformed face brought a tray and set it down. On it were two cloth napkins, a glass, and two pitchers, one big and one the size of those teensy pitchers of half and half you get in diners. The big one held what looked like lemonade. The small one contained yellow gluck that might have been pureed squash. The goose girl motioned for me to pour from the big pitcher and drink. I did so with some embarrassment, because I had a mouth to drink with. Good, I said, and it was, just the right mixture of sweet and tart. The gray girl was still standing at the goose girl's shoulder. She pointed at the yellow gluck in the small pitcher. The goose girl nodded, but her nostrils flared in a sigh, and the scar that should have been a mouth pulled down a little. The serving girl took a glass tube from the pocket of a dress that was as gray as her skin. She bent, meaning to push it into the gluck, but the goose girl took the tube and laid it on the table instead. She looked up at the serving girl, nodded, and put her hands together as if saying namaste. The girl returned the nod and left. When she was gone, the goose girl clapped for the horse. She came and hung her head over the rail between us, still chewing her last mouthful. I'm Falada, the horse said, but her mouth didn't move the way the dummy's moves as it sits on the ventriloquist's knee. She just kept chewing. I had no idea why the girl was keeping up the voice-throwing charade. My mistress is Leah. I later knew the correct spelling, L-E-A-H, thanks to Dora but what I heard then was L-E-I-A, as in Star Wars. It seemed reasonable enough after everything else that had happened. I'd already met a version of Rumpelstiltskin, and an old woman who lived not in the shoe, but below the sign of one. I myself was a version of Jack the Beanstalk Boy, and isn't Star Wars just another fairy tale, albeit one with excellent special effects? It's nice to meet you both, I said. Of all the strange things that had happened to me that day, stranger things were ahead, that was in many ways the strangest, or maybe I mean the most surreal. I didn't know which one to look at, and ended up swiveling back and forth like someone watching a tennis match. Did Adrian send you? 
Yes, but I knew him as Howard. He was Adrian before. How long since you've seen him? Leah considered this, eyebrows drawn together. Even her frown was pretty. I will try to refrain from such observations from here on, but it will be hard. Then she looked up. I was much younger, Falada said. Adrian was younger too. He had a dog with him. Not much more than a puppy. It danced everywhere. The puppy had a strange name. Radar. Yes, Leah nodded. The horse simply went on chewing, looking disinterested in the whole thing. Has Adrian passed on? I think if you are here and wearing his belt and weapon, that he has. Yes. He decided against another turn on the sundial, then. If so, he was wise. Yes, he did. I drank some of my lemonade, then put the glass down and leaned forward. I'm here for radar. She's old now, and I want to take her to this sundial and see if I can... I considered and thought of another science fiction fairy tale, one called Logan's Run, and see if I can renew her. I have questions. Tell me your story, Falada said. I may answer your questions afterward if it seems good to me to do so. Let me stop here and say I got some information from Leah by way of Falada, but she got a hell of a lot more from me. She had a way about her as if she were used to being obeyed, but it wasn't a mean or bullying way. There are people, well-bred people, who seem to realize they have an obligation to be pleasant and polite, and the obligation is double if they don't have to be. But pleasant or not, they usually get what they want. Because I wanted to be back at Dora's house before dark, I had no idea what might come out of those woods after nightfall, I mostly stuck to my mission. I told her about how I had met Mr. Bowditch, how I'd taken care of him, and how we'd become friends. I told her about the gold and explained that I had enough for now, but in time I might need more in order to keep the well that led to this world secret from people in mine who might misuse it. I didn't bother adding that I'd have to find a way to convert gold to cash now that Mr. Heinrich was dead because later, years from now, there will still be taxes to pay, and they're quite high. Do you know what taxes are? Oh, yes, Falada said. Right now, though, it's radar I'm worried about. The sundial is in the city, right? Yes. If you go there, you must be very quiet and follow Adrian's marks. And you must never, never go there at night. You are one of the whole people. Whole people? She reached over the table to touch my forehead, one cheek, my nose, and my mouth. Her fingers were light, the touch fleeting, but more of those shocks went through me. Whole, Falada said. Not gray, not spoiled. What happened? I asked. Was it got... Her touch wasn't light this time. She slammed her palm against my mouth, hard enough to drive my lips against my teeth. She shook her head. Never say his name, lest you speed his waking. She put a hand to her throat, with her fingers touching her jaw on the right side. You're tired, I said. What you're doing to make speech has got to be hard. She nodded. I'll go. Maybe we can talk more tomorrow. I started to get up, but she gestured for me to stay. There was no doubt about the command in that. She raised a finger in a gesture Radar would have understood. Down. She put the glass tube in the yellow gluck, then raised the index finger of her right hand to the red blemish, the only flaw in her beautiful skin. I saw that all of her nails, except for the one on that finger, had been trimmed short. She pushed the nail into the blemish until the nail disappeared. She pulled. The flesh opened and a rill of blood ran down from it to her jawline. She inserted the straw in the small hole she'd made and her cheeks hollowed as she sucked up whatever she took for nourishment. 
half of the yellow stuff in the small pitcher disappeared, what would have been for me just a single swallow. Her throat flexed not just once, but several times. It must have tasted as nasty as it looked because she was choking it down. She pulled the straw out of what would have been a tracheotomy incision if it had been in her throat. The hole immediately disappeared. But the blemish looked angrier than ever. It shouted a curse against her beauty. Was that really enough? I sounded appalled. I couldn't help it. You hardly drank any. She nodded in a weary way. The opening is painful, and the taste is unpleasant after so many years of the same few things. Sometimes I think I'd rather starve, but that would bring too much pleasure in certain quarters. She tilted her head to the left, in the direction I had come from, and the direction in which the city lay. I'm sorry, I said. If there was anything I could do... She nodded that she understood. Of course people would want to do things for her, they'd fight each other to be first in line. And made the namaste gesture again. Then she picked up one of the napkins and blotted away the trickle of blood. I'd heard of curses. The storybooks are full of them. But this was the first time I'd seen one in action. Follow his marks, Falada said. Don't get lost, or the night soldiers will have you. And Radar. That must have been a hard one for her, because it came out Rayar, making me think of Dora's ecstatic greeting to her. The sundial is in the stadium plaza, at the rear of the palace. You may accomplish your purpose there if you're quick and quiet. As for the gold you speak of, that is inside. Getting it would be far more dangerous. Leah, did you once live in that palace? Long ago, Falada said. Are you... I had to force myself to say it, although the answer seemed obvious to me. Are you a princess? She bowed her head. She was. Leah now referring to herself through Falada in the third person. The littlest princess of them all. For there were four sisters who were older and two brothers. Princes, if you like. Her sisters are dead. Drusilla, Elena, Joylene, and Falada, my namesake. Robert is dead. For she saw his poor crushed body. Eldon, who was always good to her, is dead. Her mother and father are also dead. Few of her family are left. I was silent, trying to comprehend the enormity of such tragedy. I had lost my mother, and that was bad enough. You must see my mistress's uncle. He lives in the brick house near Seafront Road. He will tell you more. Now my lady is very tired. She bids you good day and safe journey. You must stay the night with Dora. I got up. The blob of sun had almost reached the trees. My mistress wishes you good fortune. She says if you renew Adrian's dog, as you hope, you must bring her here so my mistress can watch her dance and run as she once did. I'll do that. Could I ask one more question? Leah nodded wearily and raised a hand. Say on, but be brief. I took the little leather shoes out of my pocket and showed them to Leah, and then, feeling a bit foolish, to Falada, who showed absolutely zero interest. Dora gave me these, but I don't know what to do with them. Leah smiled with her eyes and stroked Falada's nose. You may see travelers on your way back to Dora's house. If they are barefooted, they have given broken or worn-out shoes for her to mend. You will see their bare feet and give them those tokens. Down the road this way, she pointed away from the city, is a little store, which is owned by Dora's younger brother. If travelers have those tokens, he will give them new shoes. I considered this. Dora repairs the broken ones. 
Leah nodded. Then the shoeless people go to her brother, the storekeeper. Leah nodded. When the broken shoes are renewed, like I hope to renew radar, Dora takes them to her brother. Leah nodded. Does the brother sell them? Leah shook her head. Why not? Stores usually make a profit. There is more to life than profit, Falada said. My mistress is very tired and must rest now. Leah took my hand and squeezed it. I don't need to tell you how that made me feel. She released it and clapped a single time. Falada ambled away. One of the gray farmhands came out of the barn and slapped the horse lightly on the flank. She walked toward the barn willingly enough, the gray man walking beside her. When I looked around, the woman who'd brought the puree and the lemonade was there. She nodded to me and gestured toward the house and the road beyond. The audience, that's what it had been, I had no doubt, was over. Goodbye, and thank you, I said. Leah made the namaste gesture, then lowered her head and clasped her hands on her apron. The maid, or perhaps she was a lady-in-waiting, walked with me to the road, her long gray dress brushing the ground. Can you speak? I asked her. Little. It was a dusty croak. Hurts. We reached the thoroughfare. I pointed back the way I'd come. How far to the brick house of her uncle? Do you know? She raised a misshapen gray finger. A day? She nodded. The most common form of communication here, I was learning. For those not able to practice ventriloquism, that was. A day to get to the uncle. If it was twenty miles, it might be one day more to the city, more likely two, or even three. Counting the return to the underground corridor leading to the well, maybe six days in all, and that was assuming all went okay. By then my father would be back and would have reported me missing. He'd be scared, and he might drink. I'd be gambling my father's sobriety against the life of a dog. And even if the magic sundial existed, who knew if it would work on an elderly German shepherd? I realized, you'll say I should have before, that what I was thinking of doing wasn't just crazy, it was selfish. If I went back now, no one would be the wiser. Of course, I would have to break out of the shed if Andy had locked it, but I thought I was strong enough to do that. I'd been one of the few players on the Hillview squad who had been able to not just hit a tackling dummy and drive it back a foot or two, but knock it over. And there was something else. I was homesick. I'd only been gone a few hours, but with the day draining to an end in this sad, overcast land where the only real color was the great fields of poppies, yes, I was homesick. I decided to take radar and go back. Rethink my options, try to make a better plan, one where I could be gone for a week or even two without anyone worrying. I had no idea what such a plan would be, and I think I knew, deep down, in that dark little closet where we try to keep secrets from ourselves, that I would keep putting it off until Radar died. But that was what I meant to do. Until that was... The gray maid took me by the elbow. So far as I could tell from what remained of her face, she was scared to do that, but her grip was firm nonetheless. She pulled me toward her, stood on tiptoe, and whispered to me in her painful croak. Help her! Three. I walked slowly back to Dora's house of shoes, hardly aware of the declining daylight. I was thinking of how Leah, at that point still thinking of her as L-E-I-A, had opened the blemish beside what had been her mouth. How it had bled, how it must have hurt, but doing it because the pureed gluck was all she could take in to stay alive. When had she last had an ear of corn or a stalk of celery or a bowl of Dora's tasty rabbit stew? Had she been mouthless when Radar was a puppy? 
gambling around a much younger Falada? Was the beauty that existed in spite of what had to be extreme malnourishment a kind of cruel joke? Was she cursed to look well and healthy in spite of what must be constant hunger? Help her. Was there a way to do that? In a fairy tale, there would be. I remembered my mother reading me the story of Rapunzel when I couldn't have been more than five. The memory was vivid because of the story's ending. Terrible cruelty reversed by love. A wicked witch punished the prince who rescued Rapunzel by blinding him. I vividly remembered a picture of the poor guy wandering in the dark forest with his arms outstretched to feel for obstacles. Finally, he was reunited with Rapunzel, and her tears restored his sight. Was there a way I could restore Leah's mouth? Probably not by crying on it, true, but maybe there was something I could do. In a world where riding a big sundial backward could peel away the years, anything might be possible. Besides, show me a healthy teenage boy who doesn't want to be the hero of the story, one who helps the beautiful girl, and I'll show you no one at all. As for the possibility that my father might start drinking again, there was something Lindy told me once. You can't take credit for sobering him up because he did that. And if he starts drinking again, you can't take the blame because he'd do that too. I was looking down at my shoes and deep in these thoughts when I heard the squeak of wheels I looked up and saw a small ramshackle cart coming my way, pulled by a horse so old he made Falada look like the picture of health and youth. There were a few bundles in it with a chicken squatting on top of the biggest. Walking beside it, trudging beside it, was a young man and a young woman. They were gray, but not as gray as Leah's farmhands and maid if that slate color was a sign of sickness, these people were still in the early stages, and, of course, Leah hadn't been gray at all, just mouthless. It was another mystery. The young man pulled on the horse's reins and stopped him. The couple looked at me with a mixture of fear and hope. I could read their expressions easily enough, because their faces were mostly there, the woman's eyes had begun to draw up, but they were a long way from becoming the slits through which Dora observed the world. The man was worse. If not for the way his nose appeared to be melting, he might have been handsome. Oh, he said, are we well met? If not, have what you would take. You have a weapon, I have none, and I'm too tired and heart sore to fight you. I'm no robber. I said, just a traveler like you. The woman was wearing short lace-up boots that looked dusty but whole. The man's feet were bare and dirty. Are you the one the lady with the dog told us we might meet? That would be me, I guess. Have you a token? She said you would, for I gave her the boots I was wearing. They were my father's and falling to pieces. You won't hurt us, will you? The young woman asked, but her voice was that of an old woman. Not yet a growl like Dora's, but getting there. These people are cursed, I thought. All of them. And it's a slow curse, which might be the worst kind. I won't. I took one of the small leather shoe tokens from my pocket, and gave it to the young man. He tucked it into his own pocket. He'll give my man shoes? The woman asked in her growly voice. I answered that question carefully, as befitted a boy whose father worked in the insurance biz. That was the deal as I understood it. We must get on, her husband, if that's what he was, said. His voice was a little better, but where I came from, nobody would have given him a job as a TV announcer or audiobook reader. We thank you. From the woods on the far side of the road, a howl arose. It climbed until it was almost a shriek. It was a terrible sound, and the woman shrank against the man. 
Must get on, he said again. Wolfies. Where will you stay? The lady with the dog showed us a picture board and drew what we think was a house and barn. Have you seen it? Yes, and I'm sure they'll take you in. But hurry, and I'll do the same. I don't think being on the road after dark would be... Would be cool, was what I thought, but I couldn't say it. It wouldn't be wise. No, because if wolfies came, these two had no house of straw or twigs to hide in, let alone one of bricks. They were strangers in the land. I at least had a friend. Go on now. I think you'll get new shoes tomorrow. There's a store, or so I was told. The man will give you shoes if you show him your... You know, your token. I want to ask you a question, if I may. They waited. What is this land? What do you call it? They looked at me as if I had a screw loose, a phrase I probably wouldn't be able to say. And then the man replied, Tis Empress. Thank you. They went their way. I went mine, picking up the pace until I was nearly jogging. I heard no more howls, but the gloom of twilight was thick by the time I saw the welcome window glow of Dora's cottage. She had also placed a lamp at the foot of her steps. A shadow moved toward me in the dark, and I dropped my hand to the butt of Mr. Bowditch's forty-five. The shadow solidified and became radar. I dropped to one knee so she wouldn't stress those bad back legs of hers by trying to jump up, which she was clearly preparing to do. I grabbed her around the neck and pulled her head against my chest. Hey, girl, how are you doing? Her tail was wagging so hard that her butt swung back and forth like a pendulum. And was I going to let her die if I could do something about it? Bullshit I was. Help her, Leah's maid had said. And there, on the darkening road, I made up my mind to help them both. The old dog and the goose girl princess. If I could. Radar broke away, went to the poppy field side of the road, and squatted. Good idea, I said, and unzipped my fly. I kept one hand on the butt of the revolver while I did my thing. Four. Dora had made up a bed for me near the fireplace. There was even a pillow with colorful butterflies on the case. I thanked her, and she dropped me a curtsy. I was amazed to see that her red shoes, like those worn by Dorothy in Oz, had been replaced by a pair of yellow Converse sneakers. Did Mr. Bowditch give you those? She nodded and looked down at them with her version of a smile. Are they your four best? It seemed to me they must be, because they were spandy clean, as if they'd just come out of the box. She nodded, pointed at me, then pointed at the sneakers. I wore them for you. Thank you, Dora. Her eyebrows appeared to be melting into her forehead, but she raised what was left of them and pointed in the direction I'd come from. Z? I don't get you. She turned to her workshop and got her little chalkboard. She erased the squares indicating the house and barn she must have showed the young man and woman, then printed in big capital letters, L-E-A-H. She considered this, thinking, then added, question mark? Yes, I said. The goose girl. I saw her. Thank you for letting us stay the night. Tomorrow, we'll be on our way. She patted her chest above her heart, pointed to Radar, pointed to me, then raised her hands in an encompassing gesture. My house is your house. Five. We had more stew, this time accompanied by chunks of rough bread. Rough, but delicious. We ate by candlelight, and Radar got her share. Before I let her have it, I took the bottle of pills from my backpack and sank two of them in the gravy. Then, thinking about how far we had to go, I put in a third one. I couldn't get over the idea that, when I was giving them to her, I was robbing Peter to pay Paul. Dora pointed to them and cocked her head. They're supposed to help her. We've got a long way to go, and she's not as strong as she used to be. 
She thinks she is, but she isn't. When they're gone, I guess. Another of those drawn-out howls came from the far side of the road. It was joined by another. Then a third. They were incredibly loud, rising to screams that made me want to grip my teeth. Radar raised her head but didn't bark, just uttered a faint growl that came from deep in her chest. Wolfies, I said. Dora nodded, crossed her arms over her bosom, and gripped her shoulders. She gave an exaggerated shiver. More wolves joined in. If they kept that up all night, I didn't think I'd be getting much rest before beginning my journey. I don't know if Dora read my mind or it just seemed that way. In either case, she rose and motioned me to come to the round window. She pointed skyward. She was short and didn't have to bend to look up, but I did. What I saw was another shock to my system in a day that had been a steady parade of them. The clouds had parted in a long rift. In the river of sky that was revealed, I could see two moons, one bigger than the other. They seemed to race through the void. The big one was very big. I didn't need a telescope to see the craters, valleys, and canyons on its ancient surface. It looked ready to fall on us. Then the rift closed. The wolves stopped howling, and I mean immediately. It was as if they had been broadcasting through a giant amplifier and someone had pulled the plug. Does that happen every night? She shook her head, spread her hands, then pointed to the clouds. She was good at communicating with her gestures and the few words she could write, but that one escaped me. Six. The only door in the cottage that didn't lead to the back or front was low and Dora-sized. After she had cleaned up our little supper, shooing me away when I tried to help, she went in this door and came out five minutes later wearing a nightgown that reached to her bare feet and a kerchief on what remained of her hair. The sneakers were in one hand. She put them carefully, reverently, on a shelf at the head of her bed. There was something else there, and when I asked for a closer look, she held it out to me, obviously reluctant to hand it over. It was a small, framed photograph of Mr. Bowditch holding a puppy who was obviously Radar. Dora held it to her bosom, patted it, then put it back near the sneakers. She pointed to the little door, then at me. I took my toothbrush and went in. I haven't seen many privies except in books and a few old movies, but I guessed that even if I'd seen a lot, this one would have been the neatest. There was a tin basin of fresh water and a toilet with a closed wooden lid. There were poppies in a wall vase, giving off their sweet smell of cherries. There was no smell of human waste. Zero. I washed my hands and face and dried with a small towel embroidered with more butterflies. I dry brushed my teeth. I was only in the privy for five minutes at most, maybe even not that long, but Dora was fast asleep in her little bed when I came out. Radar was sleeping beside her. I lay on my own makeshift bed, which was a thickness of blankets and a neatly folded one to pull up over me, which I didn't need right then, because the embers in the fireplace were still putting out good heat. Looking at them as they waxed and waned was hypnotic. The wolves were quiet, with no moonlight to crazy them up, but a little wind was playing around the eaves, the sound sometimes rising to a low cry when it gusted, and it was impossible for me not to think of how far I was from my world. Oh, I could reach it again with just a short walk up the hill, a mile down the buried corridor, and 185 spiral steps to the top of the well, but that wasn't the true measure. This was the other land. It was Empis, where not one but two moons raced across the sky. I thought of that book cover, the one showing a funnel filling up with stars. Not stars, I thought. Stories. An endless number of stories that pour into the funnel 
and come out in our world, barely changed. Then I thought of Mrs. Wilcoxon, my third grade teacher, who ended each day by saying, What have we learned today, boys and girls? What had I learned? That this was a place of magic, operating under a curse. That the people who lived here were suffering some sort of progressive sickness or disease. I thought I understood now why Dora's sign, the one Mr. Bowditch had printed for her, only needed the shoe poem on the side that faced the abandoned city. It was because people came from that direction. How many, I didn't know, but the blank side of the sign suggested that few, if any, came back. If I assumed the cloud-obscured blob of sun was setting in the west, then the young man and woman I'd met, plus all the rest of the people in the shoe exchange program Dora and her brother were running, were coming from the north. Evacuating from the north? Was it a rolling curse? Maybe even some kind of radiation originating in the city? I didn't have nearly enough information to be sure of that, or even half sure, but it was an unpleasant thought just the same, because that was the way I was planning to go with raids. Would my skin begin to turn gray? Would my voice begin dropping and register toward the growl of Dora and Leah's lady-in-waiting? There had been nothing wrong with Mr. Bowditch's skin and voice, but maybe this part of Empus had been okay? or mostly okay when he was last here? Maybe this, maybe that. I supposed if I started to see changes in myself, I could turn around and beat feet. Help her. That was what the gray maid had whispered to me. I thought I knew a way to help Radar, but how was I supposed to help a princess with no mouth? In a story, the prince would find a way to do that. It would probably be something unlikely, like Rapunzel's tears turning out to have magical sight-restoring properties, but palatable to readers who wanted a happy ending, even if the teller had to pull one out of his hat. I wasn't a prince anyway, just a high school kid who had found his way into some other reality. And I had no ideas. The embers were their own magic. Waxing when the wind swirled down the chimney, waning when the gusts died. Looking at them, my eyelids seemed to gain weight. I slept, and at some point in the night, Radar crossed the room and lay down beside me. In the morning, the fire was out, but the side of me she was lying against was warm.